Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. Remember, at the top, before we get into 3rd John, which is the topic of today, the three S's, subscribe, share, and support. Subscribe, whether you find this on Transistor, Anchor, YouTube, Apple, Google, or Spotify. It's a simple thing that you can do to get more people aware of this and so that you are most often aware of this as well. The next thing you could do, obviously, is to share either by copying and pasting the link for where you found this to another medium or just telling people about the actual words that you hear me read out loud, which are the words of God. Next, you can support this program and me in general at two places. The one place to support the video and audio work is patreon.com slash tawahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o. And now I've begun aggregating my writing so you could support my writing on subjects of scripture and other subjects at aksum.substack.com. That's a-k-s-u-m.substack, S-U-B, S-T-A-C-K dot com. Today we are doing 3rd John, the third scroll of John. It is similar to 2nd John in that it is only one chapter, which means next week, God willing, we'll enter into Jude, and the week after that, we'll enter into the dreaded and splendid John's revelation. So here in 3rd John, or 3 John, or the third scroll of John, I will be reading from the American Standard Version, the ASV, just to spice things up, both for you and for me. We'll begin with verse 1 alone. The elder unto Gaius, the beloved, whom I love in truth. Again, we have this word elder, which we've explicated upon before. And elder is presbyter. People argue back and forth, typically the high church crew versus the low church crew. Is it a bishop? Is it a priest? What type of elder is this? Are there 24 elders when we get to John's revelation? Or are they 24 presbyters? What are they? Well, the early church had universal practice. And in fact, the Orthodox actually have the best argument. And when I say the Orthodox, I'll include the Afroasiatic, the Greek, as well as the Roman Catholics and the Anglicans, which are all categorized under this high church, right? You, you have the usage of incense. You have a basic usage of liturgical prayers from the beginning. You have the apostles appointing bishops who appoint priests, who appoint deacons and all this fashion. So the basic structure is there. It's not as elaborate and ornate as it becomes centuries later, especially as it is in 2020. So I think one thing we can say is that it was never a low church situation. You don't see a bunch of Quakers or a bunch of Mennonites running around in the first century or even the second century. But what we do see is what you could call a minimalist Orthodox church or a low high church, which is still getting persecuted very deeply. And in any event, they have elders or presbyters, which are one of the many people who are part of the stratification or the hierarchy or the structure of governance and ruling in the church. Here, Gaius is given a shout out. Gaius also appears not only in 3rd John, but in the Acts of the Apostles, in the magisterial letter to the Romans, and to the good old folks in Corinth, the Corinthians. And so Gaius is a fellow laborer of the Apostle Paul, that is to say, one of his disciples. He's also considered a host, one of these people like Lydia, who opens up their home, who expresses true love, or he truly loves the brethren and the sistren by showing and expressing the action of hospitality, which we'll get into later in this letter. Verses 2 to 4. Beloved, I pray that in all things thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and bear witness unto thy truth, even as thou walkest in truth. Greater joy have I none than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Disciples' growth in Christ, 
is a sign of bearing fruit and multiplying, as we learn in Genesis or Barashit. Recently, I collaborated with the good folks at the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative through the matronage of Ms. Holly Benton, and I was giving some of my two cents on Galatians chapters 3 and 4, and towards the end of 3 and in the beginning of 4, we see this movement going on. Remember that the original scripture has no chapters and verses, and the movement in the Galatian letter is that you need not fret, you need not worry about infertility, about invirility, about ED or barrenness in a biological sense, because in a spiritual sense, you have the capability, you have the potency, you have the opportunity that you need to take advantage of and grasp, which is making children of Christ, allowing your memory to be eternal, having a progeny and a legacy by teaching people about the good news of Jesus Christ. A practical example and a modern example I can give you is you have Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, who teaches Father Mark and Dr. Richard Benton, who teach me. I then teach Sunday school teachers at my parish and various younger deacons who are growing up all around North America and English-speaking diaspora. And this is how it's been going on, generation after generation, in different times and in different places, to the glory of God. Verses 5 to 8. Beloved, thou doest the faithful work in whatsoever thou doest toward them that are brethren and strangers withal, who bear witness to thy love before the church, whom thou wilt do well to set forward on their journey worthily of God, because that for the sake of the name they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We, therefore, ought to welcome such, that we may be fellow workers for the truth again. We see a commendation and appreciation and encouragement of the hospitality that is shown not only to the brethren, who are those who are in Christ, but even to strangers, all for the name's sake. And for Hebrew Bible fluent people, the name is unmistakable. Hashem, or the name, is still used as a euphemism for God, for those who treat God as if it is a word not to be chanted in voodoo or some other such witchcraft. So Hashem, or the name, is the face of God, is the presence of God. And so for the sake of the presence of God, people are being hospitable to both brethren and to strangers. We in 2020 have something to learn from the ancients in terms of hospitality. We may do it nowadays, but I do see it more as an, a, a reluctance to do something they feel obligated to do rather than something they are filled with joy in the Holy Spirit to do for the sake of Hashem or the name. Verses 9 to 12. I wrote somewhat unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Therefore, if I come, I will bring to remembrance his works, which he doeth, prating against us with wicked words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and them that would he forbiddeth, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, imitate not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. He that doeth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius hath the witness of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, we also bear witness, and thou knowest that our witness is true. Demetrius, good. Diotrephes, bad. Demetrius is being supportive and hospitable. Diotrephes is being not only inhospitable, but he loves not the truth, but preeminence. He loves being first in line. But we know from the Gospels that those who are first will be last, and those who are last will be first, that the greatest need serve other people. Instead, he is prating, babbling, foolishly and falsely teaching. So we have false teaching and inhospitability. For those of you who remember, 
Ezekiel, the scroll of Ezekiel, that magisterial scroll. In chapter 16, verse 49, we have what is called the sin of Sodom, the sodomy. And it goes against the intuition of maybe what people view sodomy as in the popular culture. Here, sodomy is defined in Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and prosperous ease was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Inhospitability is sodomy. A modern example of this kind of nonsense that I could tell you about, the bishop who ordained me, Abu Yosef, the bishop who was in D.C., Abu Samuel, and even the fourth patriarch of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Church, His Holiness and His Blessedness or His Beatitude, Abu Namark Oreos, all three of these people were cast out by American parishes. And it was one of the greatest shames that we have ever witnessed. And I'm so glad that that era is over. The Synod in Ethiopia and America has reconciled, but it just shows you uh, these people believed they were being Christian for whatever reason by deposing and making homeless three bishops, one of the bishops being the patriarch himself. It's a total misunderstanding of hierarchy in Christianity, and they would have done well to read Third John to be careful to not be so inhospitable. And really, Ethiopians have this hospitability teaching so ingrained in us that they, they shouldn't have even had to read Third John, but that I definitely would encourage them to. Verses 13 to 14, and we shall conclude. I had many things to write unto thee, but I am unwilling to write them to thee with ink and pen. But I hope shortly to see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be unto thee. The friends salute thee. Salute the friends by name. We've spoken about this before. But there is this difference between meeting face-to-face -face and committing something to the written word. Meeting something face-to-face -face allows you to have what some people in the communication field refer to as 70% of communication, which is nonverbal language. And so it's a greater benefit for those actual original addressees or that original audience. But when you expand the audience, you realize, especially at this time, they didn't have the ability to record a video, that the best thing to do to reach all generations and to reach all people in all times and all places is to take the time to commit something to the written word and then to have that written word read aloud because you are in a society in which the vast majority of people are illiterate. And so the words need to be not only written, but you need to they need to come with the instruction that they need to be read out loud for those who do not know how to read, but who can at least hear and hopefully with ears that hear. We see this minimalist, orthodox, low high church liturgical greeting at the end, which was present in the universal church at the time and makes it into everybody's liturgy, whether you be Anglican, Roman Catholic, a Greek Orthodox or Afro-Asiatic Orthodox. And that is peace be with you. This is why I end my emails to my Sunday school parishioners very often. I begin with the grace and I end with peace be with you. Glory to God for all things.